Romeo and Juliet, Act 1 Summary The Prologue A chorus or group of characters enters the stage. In a 14-line sonnet, they introduce two noble households of Verona, the Capulets and Montagues. They reveal that these two families have an ancient grudge against each other, which will bring about more fighting during the course of the play. However, from these warring families, two star-crossed lovers will appear. The two lovers will end the feud between the families through their deaths. The story of their love and the hateful relations between the two families will be the topic of the play that follows. When analysing the prologue, consider Shakespeare's introduction to Romeo and Juliet as star-crossed lovers. This phrase simply means that the lovers are set against the stars. Since the stars are used as a symbol for fate and the future, Shakespeare essentially means that the two lovers, Romeo and Juliet, will betray fate to be with each other, but it will lead to their deaths. It is an interesting structural choice to reveal the tragic ending at the very beginning of the play. However, it links to the central theme of fate, which is echoed throughout the play. Shakespeare cleverly lets the audience in on the fate of Romeo and Juliet, so that they can watch the tragedy unfold. This reinforces the tragic message that fate is inescapable and heightens the sense of tragedy in the play as a whole. Act 1, Scene 1 Two servants from House Capulet, Samson and Gregory, joke with one another in the streets of Verona. They rudely brag about their superior strength compared with the Montague men and also their ability to bed Montague women. Next, two Montague servants enter, and Samson provokes them by biting his thumb at them, a highly offensive gesture. The Montague men lose their temper, and a fight breaks out. Benvolio, the nephew of Lord Montague and Romeo's cousin, enters and attempts to stop the fray, instructing them to put up their swords. However, more Capulets arrive on the scene, and Tybalt, the hot-headed cousin of Juliet, raises the temperature by professing that he hates peace as much as he hates the Montagues. The brawl continues, and Lord Montague and Lord Capulet enter, along with their wives, who discourage them from attacking one another. Finally, Prince Aeschylus arrives and orders for the fighting to stop. He makes a frustrated speech to the crowd, bemoaning the three civil brawls between the houses, which have disturbed the streets of Verona up to this point. He threatens if it should happen again, those responsible will be executed for their crimes. The prince exits with Capulet, leaving Benvolio with Lord and Lady Montague. Lady Montague asks Benvolio if he has seen her son Romeo. Benvolio expresses concern that he had seen Romeo pacing alone outside of the city, and the Montagues tell him that Romeo is often alone these days, seemingly in depressed or melancholy mood. Benvolio sees Romeo and offers to talk with him. Lord and Lady Montague depart. In the final part of the scene, Romeo reveals to Benvolio that he is in love with a beautiful woman who will not return his affection. Benvolio advises Romeo to look for other women, but Romeo is so obsessed with this woman, who is later identified as Rosaline, that he says he cannot love another. Benvolio says that he will help Romeo to get over her. To analyse this scene, consider first the contrasting characterisations of Benvolio and Tybalt. Benvolio is identified as a trustworthy peacemaker through his attempt to try to end the brawl. His actions are juxtaposed with the fiery Tybalt, however, whose vitriolic exclamation restarts the fray. What? Drawn and talk of peace? I hate the word as I hate hell, all Montagues and thee. This identifies Tybalt's character to the audience as an antagonist, a character who opposes the desires of another. Romeo is also introduced later in scene one, and is characterised by Shakespeare as a hopeless romantic, obsessed with the object of his affections, Rosaline, who is rejecting his advances. He lyricises his feelings in mysterious comments on the nature of love, such as, O brawling love, O loving hate, which uses oxymoron to place contradictory ideas together. 
To Romeo, love is brawling, which suggests he feels like love is a fight, which causes him suffering. The contradictions in the phrase, loving hate, also hint at his future relationship with Juliet, where they love each other passionately, whilst knowing of the hateful feud between their families. Shakespeare establishes Romeo's character as dramatic in his language, passionate and highly emotional. Act 1, Scene 2 This scene begins with Lord Capulet walking with another nobleman from Verona, Count Paris. The pair discuss Paris's desire to marry Juliet. Capulet is pleased with Paris's interest in his daughter, but also suggests that they should be cautious, as Juliet is not yet 14, and too young to be married. However, Capulet suggests that he will consider Juliet's feelings on the matter, and invites Paris to a feast at his home, instructing him to woo her, gentle Paris, get her heart, so that Juliet may fall in love to seal the match. Capulet sends his servant, Peter, to invite a list of people to his feast. As Capulet and Paris exit, Peter reveals he cannot read, and will struggle to complete the task. Romeo and Benvolio then enter, still discussing Romeo's affections for Rosaline. Peter asks Romeo to read out the invitation, and Romeo notices Rosaline's name is on the list. Peter invites them to come to the feast, assuming they are not Montagues. Benvolio tells Romeo it is a perfect opportunity for him to compare Rosaline with other beauties. But Romeo assures him he will only attend because of Rosaline. This scene is particularly important in establishing the idea of patriarchal power in the play. It is set during the 14th century, a time when European women had very few rights. A woman was essentially considered the property of their father, if unmarried, and the property of their husband when they were married. Capulet's decision with Paris partially conforms to these expectations, since it was the father's role to choose a husband for his daughter. His instruction to Paris to let two more summers wither in their pride, ere we may think her right to be a bride, uses a rhyming couplet which creates a loving and gentle tone to his words, displaying Capulet's obvious affection for his daughter. Additionally, Shakespeare's use of imagery of nature, using the adjective ripe, reminds the audience of his caution as a father. Juliet is compared to an unripe fruit, not mature enough to be ready for marriage. Therefore, Shakespeare establishes Capulet as a strong but kindly father who seems to consider and take interest in his daughter's happiness. Act 1, Scene 3 At Capulet's house, Lady Capulet calls for the nurse to help Juliet get ready for the feast. Juliet enters and the nurse recalls a story from Juliet's childhood when she had fallen over and the nurse's husband had made an inappropriate sexual joke about her falling backwards when she gets older. Lady Capulet tells the nurse to hold thy peace, perhaps offended by her rude comments, and she asks Juliet about her feelings towards marriage. Juliet shows some caution here, stating marriage is an honour that I dream not of. But Lady Capulet and the nurse try to encourage her towards marriage, mentioning that the Honourable Paris will attend the feast in the evening. Lady Capulet asks Juliet to consider him as a suitor, and Juliet dutifully agrees to do so. Then, a servant enters to announce the beginning of the feast. This scene is used by Shakespeare to establish the three main female characters in the play. Shakespeare creates contrast and tension between Lady Capulet and the nurse. Lady Capulet is presented as indecisive, being unable to help Juliet without the nurse's presence. It suggests that there is some distance in the relationship between her and Juliet. In contrast, the nurse's bawdy jokes about Juliet's childhood present her as inappropriate, but also having a closeness to Juliet, which is not shared by Lady Capulet. Juliet's comments on marriage recall the words of her father in the previous scene. She says of Paris, I'll look to like if looking liking move but no more deep will I endart mine eye than your consent gives strength to make it fly. Here the word consent echoes Capulet's statement, my will to her consent is but a part, suggesting that Juliet understands the restrictions forced upon her by society. 
yet there is a hint of subtle resistance in her words, since she seems so confident that she will not marry someone she does not love. This paves the way for Shakespeare to break the conventions and rules of traditional marriage and suggest a vision of true love, unrestricted by obligations to family and property. Act 1, Scene 4 Romeo, Benvolio and Mercutio and others from the Montague household gather before attending the Capulet Ball. They have masks to conceal their identity. Romeo continues to speak of his lovesickness and Mercutio, Romeo's friend, mocks him, making several sexually provocative jokes. He then makes a bizarre and imaginative speech about Queen Mab of the fairies, who attends people's dreams. In his descriptions of Mab, Mercutio uses childlike fairy tale descriptions, interspersed with darker visions, such as soldiers dreaming of cutting men's throats. It identifies Mercutio as a talented wordsmith who offers a differing, pessimistic worldview to Romeo's idealistic visions of love. Romeo stops Mercutio, stating, Thou talkest of nothing. And as the men depart, Romeo comments that he is concerned the night's activities will have negative consequences in the future. A key quote in this scene is Romeo's foreboding admission. My mind misgives some consequence yet hanging in the stars. A clear reference to the theme of fate identified in the star-crossed lovers line of the prologue. Shakespeare continues to foreshadow the play's tragic ending as if to remind the audience that we are all mastered by fate, as symbolised by the imagery of the stars in space, which will dictate Romeo's future. Act 1, Scene 5 The Capulet Ball begins and Lord Capulet encourages the guests to enjoy themselves and invites them all to dance. Romeo catches a glimpse of Juliet dancing from across the room and is immediately transfixed by her appearance, stating, I never saw true beauty till this night. Tybalt, Juliet's cousin, recognises Romeo and asks for his sword before Lord Capulet intervenes, commanding him to leave Romeo, whom he says means no harm. Tybalt obeys, but vows not to forget this offence. Romeo then approaches Juliet, and the pair touch hands, captivated by each other. In a romantic exchange, filled with religious metaphors, Romeo asks Juliet for permission to kiss her. Initially, she rebuffs him, but eventually they kiss. The nurse enters, telling Juliet her mother requires her, and Juliet exits. Romeo asks the nurse who Juliet is, and the nurse replies, Lady Capulet is her mother. Romeo is shocked and devastated by the news. As the feast draws to an end, Romeo leaves with Benvolio and the others. Juliet is equally infatuated with Romeo, and states if he is married she will die. She then asks the nurse to identify him, and the nurse tells Juliet that Romeo is a Montague. Juliet is also anguished and frustrated that she should love a loathed enemy. An important moment for analysis in this scene is the first conversation between Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare uses the structure of a Shakespearean sonnet, 14 lines of iambic pentameter, with A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, rhyme scheme to emphasise the strength of their feelings for one another. The sonnet is the traditional form for a love poem, and it was also Shakespeare's preferred form of poetry. He published over 150 sonnets during his career. By having Romeo and Juliet recite a sonnet conversationally, Shakespeare hints to the audience at the depth of passion they are both feeling. The lines use an extended metaphor of a pilgrim, which means a holy traveller, visiting a shrine or place of worship, creating religious imagery which, again, hints at their love having a divine or perfect quality. As he takes Juliet's hand, Romeo says, If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle sin is this. My lips two blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. He compares his lips to a pilgrim, 
and Juliet to a shrine. A clever way of saying he longs to kiss her, just as a pilgrim longs to reach the shrine, their place of worship. With this metaphor, Shakespeare displays that Romeo's affections are taking a deeper and more spiritual direction, and as they kiss it becomes clear his affections for Juliet are deeper than they ever were for Rosaline.